afternoon, good evening, good to see you gentlemen, and I hope some ladies out there somewhere may be lurking on YouTube. We don't get very many females in here on the live stream, but that's okay. I hope everybody's doing well. Um, we're hanging out up here on the mountain. It's beautiful today, sunny. We've had tons of rain, but it's gorgeous today. I think we're going to hit about 22 degrees, so. And I'm glad you cooled off, Jeffrey. <laughs> Wow, the Northwest and Canada, really, that heat dome, man, that, that was crazy. It affected our weather here, made that, uh, made that weather pattern change quite a bit. Welcome to climate change. That's just the beginning, I think. Hey, good afternoon, Will and uh, Linda, good to see you. We're going to have some fun today. I hope we can have something constructive. This will be the last uh, part of this uh, Estabrook uh, book we're doing on developers. So keep in mind, we're talking about the collodion, the silver bath, and the developer kind of lock step together, working hand in hand. We're gonna, we're gonna give you Estabrook's <clears throat> ultimate developer today that coincides with his collodion, salted collodion and silver bath, and see what you think of that. It's pretty crazy, actually. Um, we'll, see, we'll see what you think. So welcome, welcome, welcome. Let's go ahead and get started here. No time like the present. Let's share this screen and get rolling. It is good to see everybody, though. I appreciate you coming in. It's a holiday weekend here in uh, the United States of America. It's called Independence Day, for those of you that don't know. Actually, it's tomorrow. Uh, but uh, probably not too many Americans in here today. I don't know. We'll see. Most of them are out uh, doing this and popping off fireworks and all that kind of stuff. Not for me, uh, not interested. Hello, Facebook user, good afternoon. Let's do this. Let's start with this uh, program and go through this. Uh, you know what's on today's show. This is the third and final part of this uh, Estabrook's um, synergy of the process, collodion, silver bath, and developer. Um, the technical Q&A, we're going to do a little bit of silver bath maintenance. Uh, we're going to rehash that. I had some questions about that. And also I had a question about uh, kind of off topic, but my philosophy, teaching philosophy or um, a pedagogy kind of thing. Recommended reading and recommended watching, both from you guys. Um, that You guys have turned me on to some stuff. So let's remember Estabrook just real quickly. We have those three. Very important essential parts, the trio, silver bath, collodion, and developer, strictly harmonizing. We all know that. We've seen this a million times, or a few times anyway. So let's recap last week. What is basic photographic chemistry? You can go back and look at this again, but we talked about total retractable silver, TRS, total reducible compounds, TRC, and that means what's left over, what's active, what's uh, influencing exposure and development, all those things. Um, to the collodion, the silver developer synchronized again. Uh, the amount of silver, the grains of the ounce in your bath and pH will determine what? It will determine the exposure, it will determine the amount of silver reduced, and it will determine basically um, the, how opaque, how, how thick, how transparent, and um, the color of it, really, um, which doesn't really mean a whole lot. And then, uh, finally, Estabrook believes that a 45-grain bath is a perfect percentage, meaning about a 98-gram bath, 9.8%, if you want to go percentage, and slightly acidic, pH 4 or so. In his ultimate clothing recipe, you can look at that last week if you didn't get that. So let's talk about developers and development. What are, what's a developer? What's the function? We kind of know that already, right? We, we've gone over this. We know that the carrier is the distilled water. We know that the reducer is the ferrous sulfate. And keep in mind here, you won't read anything about, you know, green vitriol or copper sulfate unless you're talking about intensification. So most of the old boys, Stayed with the ferrous sulfate. That's what I encourage you guys to do as well. You'll get better results. Glacial acidic acid is the restrainer. There are several types of restrainer. This is the most popular, obviously. And then grain alcohol, I kind of separated out for flow. 
This is not needed if you're new, using a new silver bath. We kind of know that. This is to help the alcohol or the developer flow over the plate. You, you start fighting that in your silver bath. Once your silver bath gets uh, polluted with solvents, you're going to have a little bit of pressure uh, resistance. And that developer developer will start and stop and leave lines and sweeps and, and all kinds of stuff. Hello, Peter Schrager. Good to see you. Um, so that's kind of the recap. That's what developer does, right? Basic uh, reduction of the iodides and bromides on the plate. We've talked about this ad nauseum. You guys know how that works. So let's talk about let's talk about Esther Brooks, ultimate developer here, the the king of all kings for positive development. Keep in mind, this is going along with his collodion, his salted collodion, and his silver bath. Don't just take this randomly and apply it to your system. You have to do this very precisely uh, according to Estabrook's formulas because it, this will not work with most people's silver bath and collodions, and we'll talk about why. Um, and that's what I say there. Keep in mind this is matched one to another. Developer needs to be matched with the collodion and the silver bath recipe. This is a working solution of about 1,064 mils without the alcohol. Uh, 1,005 mils, about a liter without the alcohol. Um, so if you break it down, you have 946 mils of distilled water, the carrier, 56 grams of ferrous sulfate. Man, check that out. Five point, basically 5.5%. That is a lot of iron in that developer. That is what I'd call a very hot developer. 59 mils of glacial acetic acid, which is, is substantial. And uh, if you're going to use alcohol, if you're using a, a silver bath that's been worked, you'll need about 59 milliliters of green alcohol. That Those numbers are way up there for me. If you look in my book, at my recipes, I'm I'm almost half of that on ferrous sulfate. Well, 30, 30, 35, 38 grams, not quite half, but that is cranked up really hot. Uh, I use a little less glacial acetic acid because we're not using that much uh, uh, iron reducer. That is a very interesting recipe. You'll see if you match that up, I'm sure you'll see good results from it. And this, again, this is for positive plates, ferrotypes, ambrotypes, uh, alumatypes, whatever you want to call them. So there it is. That is his ultimate developer recipe or the one that goes along with the book in the book. So let's just... Plow through is page 86 and 87, uh, well, 86 through, I think, I don't know how many it is, four or five, six slides, whatever it is. Let's go through as developer and development. Um, right off the bat, you see iron, <coughs> ferrous sulfate is, is the developer, the iron and the developer. The aqueous solution of iron with acid and sometimes alcohol. Aqueous meaning that it's all one unit kind of combined. Um, Talks about the ferrous sulfate occurs in the form of large transparent crystals, a delicate green color. I've talked about this quite often. Um, they didn't have this back in the day that I know of, but I, I recommend people use the heptahydrate ferrous sulfate, meaning you got seven water molecules on that on that iron, which is a clean kind of sweet smelling, smelling kind of bright green color, dissolves really easily in water. Um, a little resistant with alcohol. So if you're adding alcohol, make sure you dissolve and acid. Make sure you dissolve that heptahydrate or any whatever you're using, uh, regular ferrous sulfate, in water before you add the acid and the alcohol. <clears throat> but I recommend the heptahydrate, the, the additional water molecules. It's clean. You don't have to filter your bath or your developer, that kind of thing. The uh, iron sulfate is colorless at first, afterwards changed to a red tint. We know why that is. It's iron exposed to oxygen. It rusts. Rust is brown or red, right? So that's why it changes color. The powder is a basic uh, persulfate of iron. That is persulfate can containing an excess of oxide or base. By the addition of acidic acid to the solution, the formation of a deposit is prevented. So what he's talking about here, your glacial acidic acid will preserve the integrity of your ferrous sulfate for a while. It's it's like a it's an oxide inhibitor, if you will. 
So the action of the sulfate of iron on the nitrate, silver nitrate solution is to change its character by converting the silver of the solution to a metallic state. So really, I like to clarify this. He's, you're converting silver iodide mainly and silver bromide to the pure metallic state of silver. That's, that's what we're talking about there. Um, in which state it is deposited in the form of a grayish powder, uh, uh, the character of the deposit being somewhat affected by the acid. Various acids are used in developing a uh, solution. The most prominent are acidic, glacial acidic, nitric, citric, gallic, and pyrogallic acids. The last three, however, are more used in the process of redevelopment of negatives. I'm glad he clarifies that. The most popular, obviously, is glacial acidic acid. Nitric acid, you'll, you'll see that sometimes in the old books. Um, citric, Gaelic, and pyrogaelic is pretty much reserved for the redevelopment, pyro redevelopment process. Um, the first is, for many reasons, the best, and is generally used in solutions for the primary development of negatives and always for positives. Really important to point that out. There's reasons for that. Acidic acid is a product of the oxidation of alcohol. I don't know if you knew this or not, but when you, when you start throwing this stuff, remember all this stuff, when you go through, you'll see all this stuff has an effect. Uh, one thing leads to another, et cetera, et cetera. So acidic acid is a byproduct of the oxidation of alcohol. Spiritus liquors, when perfectly pure, are not affected by exposure to the air. But if a portion of yeast or nitrogenous organic matter of any kind be added to it soon acts as a ferment and causes the spirit to unite with oxygen derived from the atmosphere and so will, will become sour from the formation of acidic acid or vinegar. Just if you're interested, just so you know. Um, that's how that breaks down and works. The use of acidic acid in development solution, besides its preservative effect upon the solution itself, like we just talked about, is for the purpose of retarding the action of the iron and the reduction of the salts of silver to the metallic state, also favorably affecting the character of the deposit. So two things here, really important to remember. We know that the acid, we call it a restrainer, holds back development, right? It, it slows the action of that ferrous sulfate down. And if you go back to previous videos, you'll understand how that happens chemically. Um, or the reduction of the silver chemically. But why do we want to hold that back? Because we only want parts of the image that have been exposed with light to deposit the, that metallic silver. The whole plate is covered in silver, right? Silver, and you, you have AGI and AGBR all over the plate. So when you pour that developer on, you do not want the void or shadow areas reducing to the metallic state of silver. Right before I got online here, somebody posted an image up on the Facebook plate board and all the void areas were just filled with silver, right? Um, that, that's unexposed silver being developed. This is what glacial acidic acid prevents or helps prevent doing. You have to have other things in, in combination with that timing, exposure, temperature, etc. But this is what glacial acidic acid does or the restrainer does. So, and the favorable, what he calls the, um, um, the, the, the favorable uh, affecting the character of the deposit, meaning the, the quality of the silver deposited is, it, with all these things in order, is a higher grade image, a higher quality deposit of silver. So, alcohol is used in developing solution for the purpose of causing it to flow evenly and smoothly over the surface of the plate. We call that flow, right? If you do add alcohol to your developer, it's to, again, you don't get the developer sweeps, the starts, the stops, the developer islands, all the edges are complete, everything, good, clean plate. When new silver is used for coating the plate, the developer requires no alcohol. But as every plate, which is immersed in the silver solution, imparts to it a portion of ether and alcohol from the collodion film. The silver bath soon acquires enough to change somewhat the character of the sensitized surface, giving it the power to repel the developing solution. We talked about that just a minute ago. By the addition of alcohol to the developing solutions, this repelling power is overcome. 
Last week, we talked about Jeffrey building his bath tank. He, he's got his silver tank, and he, now he wants to build a, a, a box around it with a little kickstand on it. We talked about why do we want to turn that 40, 60 degrees on that? Because when that plate is in the silver bath tank, it is giving off the ether and the alcohol. Um, and you'll get the streaks and striation marks and all kinds of stuff. I have somebody at the door, unfortunately. Hold on just a second. Jeannie? 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 Oh, shit. They're here. I'm in the middle of my I'm walking around and myself. I'll, I'll, I'll try to. Uh, bad, bad timing. Yep. They're at the front door. Oh, I got contractors here. I may have to cut this. I may have. I may have to come back. Uh, I don't know. And cut. I may have to cut this short. But let's see. Uh, Jeannie's gonna get them. They're going around back. Um, what to do? Let me go. Let me go ahead and do this. Um, Uh, so, so what we're talking about here, the addition of the alcohol, uh, keeps that from, from, uh, not creating your sweeps and your marks and stuff. So you don't need it with a new bath, like we said, um, the act of developing or disclosing that, which is unknown and beautifully describes one of the wonderful processes of our art. I like how he says that. And then he goes on for sensitive for so sensitive is the plate on being removed from the bath that the smallest ray of white or actinic light falling on it leaves a mark. So we know when we have fog plates, uh, we it's either, it's most likely your silver bath or overdevelopment, this process of not having enough restrainer in your developer, but sometimes it's a light leak. And sometimes uh, we, we don't understand how little or how it's a small amount of actinic light will affect the plate. Um, <clears throat> so it goes on to say, um, the glossy black surface no longer shows, and he's talking about a ferrotype here, through the transparent clothing film, but instead a beautiful creamy opacity hides the surface from view. Last week we talked about the ideal covering of the plate. Um, we want a semi-opaque creamy plate. That's what we, we talked about when we were talking about the silver bath and clothing. Um, if now be subject to the most careful examination, no visible changes can be noted. It has the same rich yellow, yellowish color. This is what he's talking about after it, after exposing as opaque before. A very important change has, however, taken place in the character, if not the appearance of the surface, which changes can only be made apparent to the eye and the chemical action of light on the sensitized film can only be made known through the action of the developer developing solution in the process of development. Obviously, we know that, right? So. Um, Let's jump to this next one here. Uh, what does Peter P, P, Peter Schrager says? Check out Rachel video at Brattleboro Museum. Okay. Um, did my first 10 times yesterday and was beginning, was a good start, and later was a disaster. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it, it happens. People get out, and, and the weather's changing, and the environments, and you can really get yourself in, in trouble that way, um, quality-wise. So... The plate now be removed from the holder being held by the left hand between the thumb, forefinger. The other fingers are acting as a brace to support it, keep it steady. So the solution is poured gently but quickly upon the end and the corner nearest the hand and cause the flow evenly over the whole surface of the plate without allowing it to rest on any part until the hole is covered. So this is another important part. He's, tight, he's holding it, he's holding it, pinching it, whatever. It doesn't matter. I like to use a weighted tray. And I like to use the hand method. So he's talking about pouring the developer over one smooth motion. If one part gets longer or, or, or one part's avoided, you're going to have problems. You're going to have differential development. Um, the plate should always be held as to incline downward and always away from the holder. After the whole surface shall be covered, the solution should be caused to flow back and forward, gently rocking the plate taking care not to allow any of the solution to run off. Again, my technique, you can see it in videos. I pour it on, cover the entire plate like that at once, 
catch it, push it back on, and then do the rocking and start counting. Um, so he's talking about don't let any of that run off. And there's a good reason for that. There's a lot of silver nitrate in that developer, which will help with all kinds of things, the deposit, the quality, the density, everything, either when pouring on or afterwards until the process is complete. Notice he's not going to give you any times here. He's not going to give you any. We're going to talk about this in a little bit, but he's not going to give you any time here on development. The solution will hardly have covered the plate before the image will begin to be developed. And again, the warmer, the, the conditions, uh, the depending on how much strain are you have in your developer, depending on your exposure, you may, if your image it flashes up real quick, you're way overexposed. If it doesn't come up within, you know, if you don't see the highlights in four or five seconds, you're, you're underexposed. And now you're going to go too long and overdevelop it. Um, will begin to be developed. At first, slowly, then quicker and more plainly, Will it will appear until in a short time the perfect image will stand out boldly when the development is complete. And you'll know this once you get it down and you tack it down into you know 15, 18 seconds somewhere in there. You'll you'll get this experience will teach you this. It is the process of development and the chemical and other changes which take place under the action of the, the developing solution, which is desired to explain and make clear to the intelligence of the reader. That's what I just said. You'll get. You'll understand it by doing it. It's really good. It's like trying to explain how to tie your shoelaces over the phone if you've never done that. First, then we will try to explain the chemical action that takes place in the sensitized collodion film when exposed in the camera. The collodion plate, upon being taken from the silver bath, has received in and on its surface a deposit more or less dense of silver iodide, which is and silver bromide, of course, which upon being exposed in the camera to the action of light reflected from an inanimate object or from a person, it doesn't matter for a portrait, is converted to a sub-iodide. This is, this is, if you really want to get in the weeds, this is really important. The sub-iodide by, by the loss of oxygen, chlorine, etc. Or as in other words explained, the silver iodide contains a portion of oxygen which is known but has little affinity with the noble metals. But, and remember what we talked about last week, how when, when we do all this stuff, how that's removed. Um, by the action of the light, the, sil uh, the silver iodide is caused to give off a portion or all of its oxygen, and the silver with which it was combined is once, redu uh, once reduced to a metallic state. That's exactly what happens when you're pouring your developer on and your highlights, or, well, your midtones and your highlights, right? But in no, in in so small proportion as not to affect the appearance of the plate to the eye. The change that has taken place then is, sorry, this is a sub-iodide, this isn't developer. That's taken place without you even seeing it. That's the sub-iodide. It's already started to happen on the plate with before you ever develop it. The change that has taken place then is that the image of the sitter is impressed on the sensitized film, the light parts such as the face, hands, and parts of the clothing, clothing reflecting light. By a change of the silver iodide to a metallic state, the dark portions such as the hair, eyes, and shadows of the dress have no effect or very little upon the film. So in layman's terms, you have your plate in the, in the camera, you expose it without ever seeing anything, you pull your plate out, you're not gonna see this latent image on there, this is already, the highlights, especially in the midtones, have these sub-iodides. They've already started to change the material. Your developer is going to take it to the next step, but this has already started to take place. And people don't really understand that or, or get that, but you're already reducing that AGI and AGBR just by exposing it to light. You can't see it, but that's what's happening. The plate being now taken to the developing stand, interesting uh, phraseology there. The developer is an aqueous solution, again, all combined together. Aqueous solution of iron acid is flowed upon it, the effect being that the iron and acid act upon the silver nitrate with which the plate is still wet and causes a deposit of pure metallic silver upon all the parts of the surface which is prepared to receive it. Which parts are those that have been touched by the light and have been converted into a metallic state so that the developer causes a greater deposit of metallic silver upon these parts, only where metallic silver has been formed by the action of light. Really important to understand that. 
the physics, the chemistry behind it. It improves the quality of your images if you understand this. It improves how you light subjects in collodion. Man, lately I've been seeing a lot um, of images that are just com completely busy and, and just like really, uh, I don't think collodion handles that well. It can't light these busy images, a lot of content in the images very well. And it's, it's hard to separate visually for me what's going on in the image. I like, I think collodion for me personally, in my opinion, it handles plain, clean, uh, well-read subjects, well-lit subjects the best. But this is the physics and the chemistry behind it on um, development. So, sorry. Um, at this stage, when the development is complete, we find that all portions of the plate have not felt the action of light remain as opaque as before exposure and with very little, if any, change of color, remaining in the same state as when taken from the bath, that is, silver iodide, <clears throat> but the image, which now stands out plainly, is composed of metallic silver in the light and intermediate part, midtones, and the silver iodide in the shadows. Um, so he goes on to talk about if you want to put it in the bath as potassium cyanide, cyanide will just eat that silver up real quick, brighten it up, right? Eat away the midtones if you leave it in too long. And as metallic silver in this process will not deposit itself except upon a metallic surface, we can easily understand why an image may not be developed upon upon an underexposed plate, as the exposure will not have been sufficient during dura uh, sufficient duration and have formed uh, and to form a basis. An overexposure in like manner will have destroyed the proper gradations by extending the primary changes into the shadows. So what he's saying there is underdeveloped plates, you're, you're, you're not going to get anything there. An over overexposed or over um, uh, over what does he call? What does he say here? Sorry, he says um, repa um, bu 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 metallic silver and an intermediate part of the silver um, and overexposure light matter will have destroyed. I like that. Have destroyed the proper gradations. This is what what happens when you see overexposed plates. Y you just lose the essence of the positive, right? This tonal range is gone, and that's what he's talking about there. Um, I can see the first place only for the reason that if the lighting is faulty and the position is bad, the best development will not make a good picture. That's what I'm talking about. I think it really what he's talking about here is that how you arrange the subject material, the content of your image, how it's lit, and some things don't work as well as others, especially with lighting and the color and how collodion sees all of that. The whole treatment of this manipulation de demands from the operator a judicious appreciation of nature of the subject, the time of exposure, the temperature, the nature of the component parts of the developing solution and exercise of good judgment, a quick eye and a steady hand. In fact, very great importance attaches itself to every particular of this process as much to the quality of the materials used in their true proportions and harmonious effect. All of which is particularly true of the development of ferrotypes, for upon this process depends all the brilliance, brilliancy, the beauty, tone, and all that makes the picture desirable. That's exactly what we talk about every week here. We talk about quality images. We talk about the physics, the chemistry, the lighting, all of these combined. If you don't have all of them right, it doesn't matter how great your equipment is, the quality of your chemistry, um, how well you lit it. It, it, it just it has to be in order and working together. So that's what he's saying there. In the preparation of the developing solution for ferrotypes, we must first consider that we desire to produce a different effect in the positive picture from what is requisite in a negative. Talk about this a lot. Positives and negatives are on opposite sides of the planet when, you're, when we're talking about the quality of them. Um, the effects we want in the positive would be undesirable in a negative, and therefore the solution that would develop a negative properly would be unsuitable for a positive and vice versa. The positive to be admired must first full, be full of detail, as much so as the negative. That's what I think I see more than anything is the is either overexposure, using the wrong developer, re, using the wrong reducer, those kinds of things. Just eat those tonal ranges up and gone, especially overexposure. Um, 
The shadows also should be clear uh, or should be transparent and clear, but the white should be pure and as white as the pure silver will make them. Really big on that. Really, really big on that. Shadows depend on the brilliancy of the picture, meaning you need clean shadows to, to highlight those, uh, to, uh, to bring out those highlights, to, to uh, contrast them against that. So when you have your shadow areas filled and, and they're, they're muddy and mucky, I don't care how brilliant your highlights are, it doesn't matter. It's, it's a void topic. That's what he's talking about. That quality, which above all others, makes the positive or the ferrotype the rival of the daguerreotype. Wow, isn't that quite, isn't that quite a claim? I mean, I, you know, he can make that. It's an opinion, right? So here's the formula. I already showed you that uh, in the other slide. Uh, for for de, uh, The formula for developing solution give, uh, given below will be found by careful trial, everything that can be desired for ferrotypes or positives. And it is hoped that it will, if adopted for use, be always be used as directed. So what he's talking about here is saying, if you followed my collodion, salted collodion recipe, if you followed my silver bath recipe, and you follow this exactly, you will have terrific results. That's, that's Estabrook's words. The four ounces of iron should be put into a loose filter and water filtered through it. See, this is this, oh, dirty ferrous sulfate. That's what he's talking about here. We're in the 21st century. Use the heptahydrate ferrous sulfate. Don't use the uh, garden store variety ferrous sulfate. You don't need to. It will dissolve, uh, which will dissolve the iron readily. It'll, it's very, uh, very soluble in water. The acidic acid need not be added until required for use. So he's even talking about holding back on the acidic acid. But the alcohol, and most people work in the summer, so you're going to need acidic acid. You're going to need a restrainer. The alcohol need not be added at all if the solution flows readily on the plate. And it is, however, better to add it at once to make sure. So he's kind of backing off that. Say, put, put the alcohol in anyway. Um, if you're not making negatives, you could probably get away with that. I, I find it... it it, it hinders a little bit uh, the density of the negatives. Um, by varying the proportions of old and new, he's talking about here, uh, we won't go into this much, but people always ask me, can I save my developer and reuse it? Yeah, you can. Uh, read this portion of the book. He'll go through that. And he's talking about funneling, filtering it, and then adding proportions of the old and new to adjust for the situations you're working in. If you have given too much time, um, I exposure or exposure, we may weaken the solution with the old. If too short of an exposure has been made, we strengthen with the new. If the desire to produce a white ground and pure highlights, the plate may be flowed with a small portion of the old unfiltered, which gives very heavy deposits of silver. This, however, should not be done until after the plate is partially developed by the ordinary solution. So what he's talking about here is actually talking about a, a little redevelopment boost right in the middle of your developing, right? So, you know, you can, you can try that, but um, it is recommended the process of development should be carefully studied by the ferrotypist, uh, um, principally because so much of the success of the establishment depends on the production of a brilliant and pleasing pictorial effect, which in turn depends on the development. So that uh, habit of noting every varying phase of the process and applying corrections here, accelerants there and checks and aids whenever required will be found of incalculable advantage. Meaning take notes, know what you're doing, know what you've used, copious notebooks, um, record everything, remember everything. And that's funny, you'll see this, what he talks about here in just a second. Um, so in no other place will it result in so much good. As in the dark room, while watching the appearance of the image as it emerges from obscurity and nothingness. For here we have under our observation the plate. We are to judge at this time the sufficiency of the coating of iodide, silver iodide, right? Derived from the bath of the time of exposure, whether too long or too short, the propriety, propriety of lighting and posing and the action of the developing solution. So there he's talking about everything in order. In every particular of which there is an endless variation which taxes every power of the mind. So uh, who just posted that? Uh, uh, Peter said um, he was, uh, 
beginning was a good start. Later was a disaster. I think Esther Brooks addressing your, your concern there. Um, endless variation, what taxes every power of the mind and the study of which is an endless source of pleasure and excitement. In this connection, I am tempted to give expression to a feeling of contempt, which I have always felt for mere guesswork in this or any other art or business. Again, here we go. This guy is probably rolling over in his grave if he could see social media today. Talk about people coming on and just throwing stuff out there willy-nilly and random. He just he he has so much contempt for those operators back in the day doing that. Um, I have always felt for more mere guest mark in this or that or any part art or business. It betokens the lack of that careful habit of study and observation, without which no considerable considerable degree of success can ever be obtained attained you you can you can fake your way through for a little while but at some point you're going to hit your wall what would be said of the watchmaker to whom you had taken your watch if he could not indicate the exact nature and cause of the stoppage or the variation you wish corrected so if the pharaoh type so of the pharaoh typist if he could not tell wherein his picture was defective and not have the ability to apply the proper remedy. Of course, all this must be acquired, but it can never be acquired without much painstaking study. Again, I say to the pharaoh typist, observe and remember, experiment and remember. If you make a mistake, remember, or you're successful, remember, remember everything. I love that. He, he really encapsulates everything that, that you know, anyone that teaches this process should wrap their arms around this and help the people trying to learn this process, how it actually works and what does what in the process. So you can find remedies for your problems. You will have problems unless you're extremely wealthy and can set, throw away a new silver bath and new chemicals and do them at new every time. Like Taller says about silver baths, he says, man, I wish we could use a brand new silver bath every time, but we can't. We just, we just don't have that kind of money. So this is really important. And I love how Asta Brick stresses this. I think this is as important or even more than some of, the, um, some of the technical stuff. He goes on to talk about potassium cyanide and its use of, of fixing plates. I'm not going to go into a lot of that. You can definitely come back and read this or, or uh, go download the book if you have it. We just talk about cyanide as a as a its affinity to silver. Loves to eat that silver up, and that's why it's such a great um, fixer. Um, and it, I will I will read this. Um, the solution of uh, potassium cyanide is a most energetic agent in dissolving the insoluble silver salts. In other words, all your unexposed silver on the plate, you put it in your uh, in your fixer. Cyanide, it has the most, it's the most effective of removing the fastest, the, the quickest way to clean and wash your plate. That's why you don't have to run water on them for 30 or 40 minutes like you do with some of the, the hypo and the, the uh, other fixers. Um, far more in proportion to the quantity used than the hypo sulfate of soda, the, the, the hypo right there, he says it. So we won't go into that right now, but I do want to talk a little bit about developing images. Now, this is this is Matthew Carey Lee's book, but I just want to uh, go back to what Esther Brooks saying here, and, and Carey Lee follows up really nicely with this. It follows from what has been said here and elsewhere that the operator must be governed in his deploy development by a principle quite different from that which guides him in exposure. So development is different than exposure when we're looking at getting a quality image. Let's just keep that in mind. For whilst his exposure must be timed with a view to the worst illuminated part of the subject, right? D uh, exposing for shadows, void areas, whatever, right? Um, the development will be guided by the highlights. That's why we say you pour your developer on, your highlight should appear in a perfect situation, 20 degrees Celsius, everything being equal in three, four seconds, mid-tone, seven, eight, nine seconds. And then your shadow or your void areas, they call it, you know, they look at the drapery where the folds are and you, you start seeing that appear 12 to 15 seconds. Then you start pouring water on or running it underwater to, to arrest the development. 
These two principles are of such capital, it may ex be expressed in two rules as follows. Expose the plate for the dark shadows, leaving the lights to be cared for in the development. Develop, the, develop for the highlights, keep the eye steady fixed on the very highest light, the densest spot of the plate, and will stop while, while that is transparent enough to preserve its perfect molding in the print to be made from it. He's talking about natives there. It still applies to positives though. Um, when I, and some of you have been in my workshops, and if you remember, we talked about um, when you're looking on, on the ground glass of the camera, you got your loop, and I always tell people, look at that image. Where's the highlight? Oh, her face or his face or this object. There's a the highlight. So now you're going to take that in the dark room. You're going to pour developer on. You're paying attention to that highlight, just like he says. You want to pay attention to the highlights in development. Pay attention to the shadows and exposure. Pay attention to the, the highlights in development. <clears throat> the shadows are not to be watched in development, except in local redevelopment. Uh, they have been or should have been cared for in the exposure, correct. Not that they are indifferent, far from it. But in point of fact, watching the highlights is doing the best possible solution for the shadow, or best possible for the shadows, right? The object of continuing the development as long as possible being to get out as much detail in the shadows as possible. Again, he's talking about negatives here, but it still applies to positives. Um, not they, however, but the highlights are to be watched because we are so ascertaining the exact moment at which the development can be pushed no further, but must be stopped under pain of producing chalkiness, flat light, which is simply ruinous, meaning overdevelopment. That's, you could have said that, but that's overdevelopment. Um, so I wanted to run that by it. Matthew Carey Lee's books are wonderful. They're, they're really great. Um, Let's move on to the technical Q&A here real quick. Uh, I have some questions, and I think, Conrad, if you're out there, you're, you're listening, this is mostly for you. But everyone will get a little something out of it, I think. If you have my book, you can look at um, heavy maintenance or maintenance of your silver bath on page 117. I break it down in three parts, all coming from the 19th century literature and early 20th century all coming from this literature. Regular maintenance. So I make plates all day. Uh, at the end of the day, I take my silver bath. And if you've done a workshop with me, you know this. You, you've watched me. We, we do it at the end of the day. We put our funnel in our bottle. We put our pads, our, our, our coffee filter, our pads, and we filter all the little bits of collodion crap out. It'll, it even aerates a little bit. Put it back in the bottle and put it away in the dark, cool place until the next day. That's regular. That's regular maintenance. You don't leave it in your tank. You don't, uh, you just don't push it back into something. Um, filter it, let it aerate just a little bit. I had somebody contact me once. They were having problems with their plate. This is 15 years ago or longer. And they said, man, my plates are looking crappy. And I said, tell me about your silver bath. He went on and on. He, I said, what, what's that again? He said, oh, my silver bath is just out there in my studio. I said, but you, you filter it, you take it out of the bath, every all that stuff? Oh, no, it's been out there for three or four months just sitting there. It's like, oh, my God. So, yeah, you just do a little bit. At your, at your end of the day, you don't want stuff flying in there. You don't want evaporation of your water um, unless you're doing, you know, light maintenance that we're going to talk about next. So you want to keep it filtered, clean, and then give it a little aeration at the end of the day. Light maintenance. Put it in a large glass cookie jar or large glass container with a wide mouth opening. Um, allow it to sit in the sun for several hours or south facing window for hours or days. It's very important to allow it to aerate. You want those solvents out of that solution. That's that's the idea. That's that's a major portion really of, of, of maintenance here. Light and, and regular or light maintenance is to get those solvents out of there. Uh, let the let the organic material precipitate out. It turns black, falls to the bottom. You check your, you filter it, you check your specific gravity and pH and adjust accordingly. That's light maintenance. Now to heavy maintenance. Um, this is what, this is, I think Conrad's having a problem here. Um, if you have pinholes or if you have problems you just can't get rid of and you know it's the silver bath. Um, if you have contamination, which happens a lot, I, I can't believe how many people have contamination in the silver baths. Uh, that image before here was uh, Annabelle's there. 
that's not the proper color of a silver bath right there, right? So contamination is a big one. So if you have one liter of silver, you're going to take 250 mils of distilled or deionized water. You're not going to pour the water into the silver bath. You're going to pour the silver bath into the water in a large glass cookie jar. Wide mouth. At least I say 1.5 liters, uh, 1,500 milliliters. Give yourself some room. Pour the silver bath into the water. Remember Estabrook? This will remove the maximum amount of iodides in your bath. The iodides are precipitating out on your plate and creating the pinholes. That's what's happening. The first objective is to remove as many iodides as you can. That will allow it to happen. Pouring your silver into your water, not your water into your silver. Very important. Add a very small amount of baking soda. You can use ammonia too, but I don't recommend that. Baking soda is great. It's fine. Two to three percent solution until your bath is neutralized. Remember in high school, your basics and acids, once you start eye dropping the drops of, of baking soda into that acidic uh, silver bath, you're gonna start foaming. It's gonna look like a rabid dog. Do that until it uh, is neutral. That's our objective. Once it's neutral, water is gonna remove a lot of the iodides and we wanna neutralize it so we can then add the silver back and pH and get adjust that. Sun and air, air aerate the bath for several hours or days. I want to point something out here to Conrad. His silver bath has gone from yellow to yellow green to now red. Don't concern yourself too much with that because at the end of the day, silver carbonate is a chemical compound. You'll see the Ag2CO3 there. It, the salt is yellow, but typical samples are grayish due to the presence of the elemental silver. This is the color you see silver baths a lot of after you put the soda in. Um, like um, it will change colors over time and exposure to light and oxygen. So you're going to change. It doesn't matter what color it is unless you've really contaminated it bad with something. I've seen people who have poured varnish in their silver baths and had all just all kinds of crazy stuff happen. Sodium thiosulfate, all kinds of stuff. So this is normal. Follow through the procedure. And if you, if you need to neutralize the bath, you need, you need to get rid of the iodides, neutralize the bath, sun it, aerate it, it'll, it'll throw all that black crap to the bottom, decant the good silver off the top, check your specific gravity, check your pH, adjust accordingly with nitric acid if you need to, and on your way you go. I hope that helps. And if you can't quite get to seven, remember your bath, your silver bath is gonna be more acidic Remember that the alcohol and, and, and uh, uh, acidic acid producing and the nitrocellulose, right? It, it, it becomes more acidic over time. So remember that. Uh, Dale Wilson Photography. Hey, uh, Quinn, a couple of years ago, I started sending my silver on an electronic, uh, electronic stir set on slow. Typically, solvents are less dense than water, but suspended. Let's see if I can put it up here. But... Um, but suspended AGI it may supersede that notion, of course. Therefore, it may have continual motion appears to exaggerate the aeration. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, even better. He's talking about a, a magnetic stir, and you have your little bar in there that spins that. I mean, in a perfect world, right? And again, you know my position on getting equipment and another thing to put in your, you know. But if you can do this and you have access to, to sun it and aerate it on a magnetic stir, why not? Spin it out. Of course, you're going to. The more you move that, obviously. But um, remember how in the silver bath, that's why we have that boss tilted. Remember how those solvents come off and it'll actually streak your plate like that. That's it. Just if you don't have a magnetic stir in a bar, you can just do it out, aerate it well that way. So I hope that helps. I hope that makes sense. Um, yeah, I, I had somebody ask me about my teaching philosophy. Here's my teaching philosophy. It comes from Socrates, Einstein, Galileo. Uh, Socrates, I cannot teach anybody anything. I've always said that. I can only make them think, I hope. Einstein, I never teach my pupils. I only attempt to provide the conditions in which they can learn. Absolutely. And Galileo, you cannot teach people anything. You can only help them discover it within themselves. So that, that is my, for the email I got, that is my teaching philosophy right there. That's, that's all I can do. Um, I can't teach, I can't teach you this process. People say, Oh, I learned this process from, you know, yeah, but really, if you're, if you're really good at it, you taught yourself the process. Somebody may have guided you down the road, but you took the reins and you got motivated and you learned the process. 
you teach yourself this process. There's, there's just no two ways about it. So I know it's not technical, but I wanted to throw that in there for a second. All right, Paul from the UK, Mr. Paul Smith. Thank you for this book. It was a wonderful read. We have something similar um, here. It's a different type, but it's, it's the case for working with your hands and why office work is bad for us and fixing things feels good. It is so true. This is a great book. And if you haven't read it, I, I, you work in wet collodion. This is right down your alley. You'll love this book. It'll justify your love for ritual, your love for failure, your love for the frustration we feel in the process a lot of the times. Um, why do some jobs offer fulfillment while others leave us frustrated? In this inspiring and persuasive book, Matthew Crawford brings, it, brings to life the immense psychological and intellectual satisfactions of making and fixing things, arguing that the skilled manual trades may be one of the few sure paths to a good living. When the point of education becomes the production of credentials rather than the cultivation of knowledge, it forfeits the motive recognized by Aristotle. All human beings by nature desire to know. So if you haven't read this, I, I, I encourage you to grab it. Thanks for that, Peter or uh, Paul. I know you sent that to me a very long time ago, and I'm just getting to it. And then recommended watching. Thank you, Jeffrey, for this. Amazing. This is amazing. In fact, they even talk about ghost dance in here. They talk about Native Americans, Indians, indigenous peoples, uh, their contribution to all forms of music. I, I, I got this soundtrack on my audio now. I absolutely love this film. If you haven't seen this, I encourage you to. Um, Rumble, if you remember, Link Ray and that, that Rumble tune. Uh, just watch the film. It's amazing. It's on, uh, it's on Amazon, I think. Or no, not, uh, maybe it's on Amazon. Uh, it's a PBS, public broadcasting here in America, but uh, very, very powerful. It talks about the marginalized communities, uh, indigenous peoples, and their contribution being completely overlooked in music. And it's a music I love. And I love how they talk about ghost dance and sun dance and this fear of the other. It goes back to our conversations about Becker and Sheldon Solomon and all that. Um, so the, thank you, Jeffrey. That was a wonderful recommendation. Just, just fascinating. I absolutely love that. Um, let's go to, oh, let's watch a little bit. Let's watch this clip. Song came on the radio, a guitar instrumental, and it changed everything. Link Ray, it's rock and roll. Rumble. Yeah, that's the one. Rumble. Hey, Rumble. Rumble. He had the power to help me say, Fuck it. I'm going to be a musician. And then I found out that he was an Indian. The music that we know here in the United States is fully supported by input from Native and Indigenous people. Mr. Randy Casino! Randy had become one of the most influential heavy metal drummers in the world. This is Jesse Ed Davis. I particularly fell in love with Jesse Evan Davis. He was a Taj Mahal. And Taj's album is what spurred me to rock more. And here's your rock and chair lady, Mildred Bailey. From 16 to 20 years old, that's the only thing I listened to was Mildred Bailey. I just said, I want to learn how to sing like her. Figuring out that these people were Indians, and then I started to ask ourselves, why didn't anyone else know that? There was this key expression, be proud you're an Indian, but be careful who you tell. All of a sudden, I was talking about Native American issues and big time television. And all of a sudden, everything disappeared. From Charlie Patton to Link Ray, Andre Robinson invented the genre. Jimi Hendrix, the best in his field. Jesse Davis, everybody wanted him. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? On too long under the radar. Uh, 
excellent film. Highly recommended. You know, it's uh, it's amazing. I, I I've listened to Robbie Robertson for over 20 years, and uh, and and then just to be turned on to to all these other artists, there's there's, there's an incredible uh, richness in the Southern Indian music uh, that's influenced by jazz and Cajun music. It's just wow. Watch the film. I mean, if if you don't love music, um, what, you, I know you guys love music. Everybody probably on here loves music. You will be enlightened, and you'll be turned on some some really good. I've been listening to that album for like the soundtrack from that for like three or four days. So thank you again for that. Um, uh, Peter says, "How can I top off my silver tank for eight by ten? Great question. Um, when you when you I originally did eighty four grams to one fifty. Uh, okay, if you if you're if your clothing is matched with that, no problem, right?" It, it, you can match these things up like we've talked about any way, any way you want. Um, if, if we remember, if we remember this here, um, this will tell you, you know, you're in that, you're in this 40 grain bath arena, right? So if your collodion Peter looks anywhere like that, you're, you're good to go. If you've matched that up, no problem. Um, uh, so how do I top it off? You top it off by, saying uh, if your eight by 10 tank holds one liter and you're down to 800 mils and you don't want that stripe at the top of your plate, right? Uh, take your silver, put it, put your 200 mils of distilled water in a cookie jar and pour your silver into that. Even if you precipitate iodide out, if it turns cloudy, just measure the specific gravity and put the silver needed in and it'll clear. That's a really easy way to do that, really simple. Simple, simple, simple. So uh, let's see. That is all I have. I don't know what happened to my contractors, but they, my wife, I apologize for jumping out like that. But I, I this morning I was thinking, oh my God, I bet you they're going to show up right, right when I start the show. But we made it through this. I hope, any other questions? I, I, I'm here, so I'm not going to run off. And Hey, Baron, good to see you too from Heidelberg. Um, Facebook user, I don't know who that is, but hello. Um, and anything, hey, Jan from Norway. Uh, Thilo, good to see you too. So just acknowledge, I like to acknowledge people that come in. We need to say hi to everybody. So um, no more questions. Thanks for another, hey, absolutely. Thank you, Will. We will see you next Saturday, I hope. I don't know what we got cooking. Uh, maybe we'll look at some, uh, uh, fix and um, varnishing next week um, and see what we can kind of complete. The reason why this ended here, we just did collodion, silver bath, and developer. Those are the components, right? Everything else is kind of ancillary. Everything else is kind of open to, hey, I like shellac. Hey, I like modern varnish. I, hey, I like sandarac. It, it, great, whatever works. We can talk about those things. If you have suggestions, send it to me. If you have questions, send me those. And we will return next Saturday with another edition of the Studio Q Live Show. Stay healthy, stay happy. I'm a busy guy. I got to get going. And I'll see you next Saturday. Bye-bye. Have a great weekend.